Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Glad you're here today. It's always a pleasure to be up front in any capacity. Karen Jane, I appreciate your stewardship, your, uh, your stories are beautiful. I love them. And I always wondered why you look out across the field and I said, well, I wonder why they left that tree there. Yeah, I know why. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, Mary Jane. We've had a lot of trees in our neighborhood tore down lately, haven't we? Scripture verse for today, 2 Samuel, excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 10. And it says in the New English translation, it says, It's not by one's own strength that one prevails. And that leads me to uh, a verse that I have in my mind all the time. And it is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Lean not on your own understanding. And uh, Hannah, well, this is Hannah's uh, prayer in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. And this is after she has gone through, uh, it, it was pretty traumatic for Hannah, but I think Hannah is focused. And her focus, I believe, is where our focus ought to be. And, and that's on her Lord. She's always focused on God, and uh, she would have to be because her husband was, uh, uh, in the spirit of prophecy, it, it, it says, the blessing so earnestly sought by every Hebrew was denied this godly pair. That's Elkanah and Hannah. Elkanah is Hannah's husband. And it says, their home was not gladdened by the voice of childhood, and their desire to perpetuate his name led the husband, as it did many others, to, contact a, to contract a second marriage. But this step prompted by a lack of faith in God. So this was not God's plan for every man. It was one man, one woman. That's how God started off this great creation of his. It said, it did not bring happiness because the, the new wife's name, um, uh, is Penina. I hope I said it, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Penina. Uh, gave Elkanah children. And it, it, it wasn't just for the children that Penina had. Penina kind of uh, aggravated Elkanah. I mean, she, I could imagine, ah, you can't have any children. You know, making fun of her. And, and uh, making it hard for, for uh, her to even stay around. She probably didn't like her in the home. I mean, can you imagine two women cooking in the same kitchen? Anyway, I, I, I believe me, I know what it's like because my wife does not even like anybody in the kitchen. I go in the kitchen when she's cooking, it's like, I, I know it's time to get out real quick. If I'm going to get something, I'm in and I'm out. So anyway, I could imagine what these two girls were going through. Now, uh, every year they went to uh, make the sacrifice at the temple. And early on in this chapter, in the beginning of the book, in 1 Samuel, he talks about um, Hophni and Phineas. I hope I'm saying Phineas. Phineas, right. But uh, they were the sons of the priest Eli, and they were some bad boys. I mean, they... I, we don't have to talk about what they did, but, but one of the things they were doing was uh, they were taking the, the uh, sacrifices that the people would bring. They were stealing. They were, they were saying, we're, take it or we're taking it. The way they give it or we're taking it. And so, of course, uh, they were giving part of their sacrifice to these two boys, and they would just take it and cook it and have a party with it and roast, roast it and eat it. Now, <clears throat> 
the, the amazing thing about this is Hannah had to know this. And this is why I think Hannah, I know Hannah was a woman of God. Because, um, well, Elkanah always gave Penina and the children their uh, meat for the sacrifice and whatever else they gave for the sacrifice. Well, uh, Elkanah loved Hannah more than he loved Penina. So he would always give her a double portion so she could, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if she would, he was trying to make her look better or what, but she always had a, a double portion to give for the sacrifice. Well, at this one uh, instance, Hannah was in the, in the sanctuary and she was asking God why she was not blessed, and I'm paraphrasing, why she was not blessed with a child. And uh, she was moving her mouth kind of funny, praying in silence. And the priest, e Eli, said, Are you drunk? You need to quit drinking. I mean, you're drunk in the, in, in the sanctuary. And she says, Oh, no, my Lord, I, I'm not. I haven't been drinking. She says, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just very upset because I haven't had any children. And, and Eli blessed her. And when she went home, she had uh, relations with her husband, and she got pregnant. She was very happy, but she had promised the Lord while she was crying that she would give the child to the temple forever. And this child is one of the greatest prophets that has ever been in God's church. And if you don't know, his name, his name is Samuel. It, 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 it's, it's incredible that, that Hannah would even go to these links. To, uh, she, she wasn't asking God for anything but to uh, give her a son that she could return to the Lord. Which is amazing because she knew that she had, she had to wean her son. And right after she weaned her son, she took him to the temple and left him there with Eli to raise him with these two uh, knuckleheads, my only call. Uh, Hophni and, uh, and Penina. I hope I said that right. Phineas. Phineas, I'm sorry. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's okay. The truth can stand scrutiny, believe me. <laughs> Hophni and Phineas. I think I said that right. Anyway, um, so she left Samuel there. And this is when Sam, Samuel was, was quite young. I mean, this is right after he was weaned. And most, the Levitical laws say that a, a man has to be 25 years old before he can go into the priesthood. This is a rare thing right here. Very rare. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so Samuel, he hears the voice of the Lord calling Samuel. Samuel. And Samuel he, he's never heard the voice of the Lord, so he's, he runs into Eli and he says, Eli, what can I do for you? <clears throat> Eli says, what are you talking about? I didn't say anything. So <clears throat> Samuel goes back to his cot where he lays his head. And, he's, and he hears the, Samuel, Samuel. And he runs back and he says, yeah, Eli, what can I do for you? And Eli says, uh, I didn't call you. And he says, Eli figured out because the Lord was calling Samuel. He says, Eli. He says, Samuel, next time you hear the voice, say, here I am, Lord. What can I do for you? I'm paraphrasing. So sure enough, it happens. And, and uh, Samuel gets a word from the Lord, and he scares him. He's scared because it's about Eli and his sons. And he doesn't want to tell Eli. And Eli knows something's up. I guess he can tell by um, Samuel's demeanor. Because if, if you're raising somebody, you kind of know how they are. You know, you see them, you see how they act. Well, he sees them, Samuel's the meeting, he says, he says, don't lie to me, boy. <laughs> I mean, paraphrasing again. He says, what did the Lord say? And so Samuel told Eli everything. And uh, so sure enough, uh, Eli had allowed these things to take place in the temple. And... He, he, he did nothing about it. 
And the Lord says, well, I'm, I'm going to take the lives of your sons. And Hophni and uh, Phineas decided they were going to go to war with the Philistines. I mean, how do you get this just bright idea? I'm going to go fight. We're going to go fight the Philistines today, Dad. And Dad says, I don't know what Dad says, Eli, Eli. He doesn't stop them. And they take the Ark of the Covenant of God. I mean, you take the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when you take the Ark of the Covenant of God to go before you, you want to do it in reverence and in prayer. And you want to know that God is speaking to you, saying, this is what I want you to do. You don't just say, take on a whim, say, hey, we got the covenant of God over here. We're going to take it and go in front of it. And, and, and they're going to run because we got the covenant of God. And if we got the covenant, God has to do what we say. I mean, this is their attitude. God, that's like uh, people that say if they've got enough faith, and this is sad. If you've got enough faith, God has to do what you want, what He wants you to do. That is not how God operates. God is not our genie. God is everything to us. God is, uh, and we have to remember, God. what God wants for us is so much better than what we want for ourselves. Let's not ever forget that. I mean, when, when things are going bad in your life, um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to that. So the uh, the Ark of the Covenant goes before the Philistines and, and, and Hophni and Phinehas are killed in the battle. And word gets back to Eli, and Eli was a heavy man. He must have been leaning back in his chair, or he had a two-legged chair or something, or three, but he's leaning back. And the weight of his body broke his neck when, he, when they told him about the ark being taken and his sons being taken. The, uh, it broke his neck and Eli died that day also along with his sons. Um, when God says something, we can take it that he means what he says. Amen. He never says anything I mean, when God's Word has created power in it, when God says something, that, that, that's it. That's, I've heard it said that God cannot lie. It's not because God won't lie. It's because God can't lie because whatever He says, it is. I've had arguments. Oh, we won't go there. But anyway, uh, hey, i still got a lot of time left. i got a whole lot more. No, I'm just holding your leg. <laughs> I shouldn't do that in the pulpit, but you know, I'm so tempted sometimes to uh, say things that to be abusing it, and I don't mean to be not abusing it. Uh, what I want to go back to is what I said a few minutes ago. And this fan keeps blowing. Donald, can you turn that off, please? I can find this right here. You got a remote. Oh, okay. That would be good if you just turn them off. I'm not hot. If I start dripping sweat, I have to get to turn them back on. I sweat it all. I sweat out this week already. <laughs> anyway, some of you know what I'm talking about. Okay, I want to go back to what I said. Well, I want to finish. Uh, let me go back to uh, uh, the prayer of Hannah. And I, and I want us to understand about what the prayer of Hannah starts in uh, Samuel chapter 2, and it goes from Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to verse 10. If you look in that, uh, and I'm not going to read it all. I'll, we read the one part, uh, chapter 9, the second part. It says, For by strength no man shall prevail. Lean not on your own understanding, and lean not on your own strength. That's basically what. Scriptures tell us here. Amen. Now, if you look at this prayer real close, if you examine it, we're not going to read it. Uh, Hannah does not pray anything for herself. Nothing, there's no, not a selfish thing in this prayer. She's not saying, God, Lord, bless me. Lord, please take care of Samuel. He's around in two hoodlums. I mean, he does not ask. She, I mean, she does not ask for these things. She praises God through all of these, uh, through through this prayer. She asked for nothing for herself. 
But God blesses her with three sons and two daughters. Some of us might not think that's a blessing, but back then, that was a blessing. Five children. Counting Samuel, she has six children. She was blessed beyond anything. And she was not uh, selfish by no means. And I want to take you to one other prayer in Scripture. And I hope I got this right. It, maybe you can straighten me out once I get here. I'm going to go look at uh, Psalm chapter 63. And um, the... Uh, The title of my sermon is The Presence of God. And, what I, and I, I must wrestle between the two, between another title. What God wants for us is so much better than we can imagine. That was my other title in my mind. God wants for us more than what we can even imagine. Yes. And if you go to Psalm 63, oh, which is the right one. Yes, it is. My brain works once in a while. This is one of the most incredible psalms you'll ever read. It's, it's short. We're not going to read it. But I want to point out a couple things. David is marching through the desert. Actually, he's running through the desert. He's running from King Saul. And he, he's been running from Saul for 10 years. That's like, can you imagine... God told him before all this began, you're going to be the next king. David had an opportunity to, to slay Saul. God put, or the Holy Spirit was in David's heart that, that he was taught to not harm God's anointed. And if we go back to 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel, I can't remember which chapter's in, they... The people were upset because Samuel's children came along and they were no better than Eli's children. And the people wanted a king. They asked for a king because they were disappointed with the priesthood. And God was like, I'm your king. I mean, I'm paraphrasing again. God said, I'm your king. He told Samuel, he says, if they want a king, Give them a king. And I want you to tell them the kind of king they're going to have. Well, they got Saul, King Saul, who was uh, not a very good king. He started out well, but he did not end well. Uh, he was a good man, but I guess power corrupts. Anyway, uh, King Saul is chasing that, and he's got 500 fighting men. Now, these 500 men must have been the toughest guys that you could ever think of. I mean, these, probably, these, these guys were probably all like pulp wood guys, you know, they cut logs and moves. <laughs> they were just probably powerful, powerful men. But they also had families. So they were, he had, he's like, if each one of them had a wife and each one of them had a couple of kids, how many people were running around the desert? I'm, I'm just telling you this to give you a size of, uh, of what David is leading through the desert. And if you look at this psalm, he praises God in this psalm. He does not ask for food or water. And one of, one of the lines I would like to read, he says, Because your loving kindness is better than life. Amen. That's where I would like for us to focus this morning. The presence of God. David had the presence of God. He needed nothing else. He did not need water. He did not need food. That was his attitude. God fed him. God took care of him. God gave him water. But that was not part of his prayer. God, David gave him thanks. So, if we're here to worship God today, and I want to look at uh, Hannah's prayer and David's prayer. What did they have? They had the presence of God. That is what I would recommend to, to the newest Christian and to the Christian that has been around the longest. 
you're not seeing things happen in your life, miracles, talk to God about it. Don't talk to the pastor. Don't talk to the head elder. Don't talk to your husband even. Go to God. I heard the story. I'm blown away by the story. And I've heard several stories about prayer. But this one, <clears throat> this lady learned that if she prayed, <coughs> excuse me, if she prayed, <coughs> Brianna, will you get me a bottle of water? Please. That God would fix everything. And this is earnest prayer. It's not like uh, a casual prayer like, Lord, bless me, bless my family, bless my friends, bless this person that's sick. Thank you, Lord. May, you have, may we have a good day. It, it's not a, a, you know, a casual prayer. This woman prayed an hour a day every day. And I think she increased her prayer after a couple of months because once you start praying to God, you thirst. You thirst. You thirst for more and more and more because the more you have God's presence, thank you, the more presence that you want. And this lady, she was sick of dealing with her children and her husband because they quit going to church. Or Children didn't go to church, or husband didn't go to church. And after, I think, the second or third month, it's not about um, uh, getting things from God. It's about a relationship. And the more you have that relationship with God, the more presence you have of God. And the more presence you have of God, the more the people around you will see the presence in you. This woman's husband decided she wanted to go to church with her. And he, she was like, and she didn't even ask God for this. God gave her that. Her children turned around and started going to church with her. And she never asked. God was, she had the presence of God. And for the presence of God, and she, she asked for none of this. The presence of God changed her life. So, if we're here to worship God, and we don't have the presence of God, are we having true worship? If we don't have the presence of God, there's only two powers on this planet. There's Satan, and there's God. We worship one or the other, indirectly or directly. We don't realize it. If we're not worshiping God, <coughs> we're doing Him a disservice. By even having a meeting. <laughs> that sounds terrible coming from that hour. But we have got to have true worship. You know, if we're having true worship, I, I heard this said one time, and, I, and it was like, I almost fell off my chair. The guy said, if you're having true, stuff, true worship, he says, where's the stuff at? Where's the stuff? He says, where's the miracles? How many people are, are coming into our church? Is our parking lot full? Now, I'm not blaming any one of you one people. I'm as guilty as anybody else for not practicing the presence of God. We need to pray, and this is going to sound kind of funny. We need to pray for what we should pray for. We need to ask God what we should pray for. If we bring our own works and ask God to bless our works. If we ask God to bless our works, we're no different than Cain bringing his works to the altar saying, bless my works, God. What did Abel brought? What did Abel bring? What God prescribed, a blood offering. God said, this is my work. When you have the works of God in you, I love this story, and, I, and I've told it before in the but when you have the works of God in you, the children of Israel, are, after their 40 years of marching in the desert, are standing on the edge of the Jordan. And it's during the flood season. 
So it's pretty wide across there. It's probably over a mile across the Jordan in that area. During the flood season, not, when it's not the flood season, they say you can walk across it. It's flat. But it was during the flood season. And they're standing there, and God says, go into there and take the land. And they're standing there on the banks of the river looking at it. And the water's rushing by. I'm probably out of that picture, sorry. <laughs> the water's rushing by, and they're, 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 God says, go over there. So they start to march. The water splits. At the Jordan, this is just like the Red Sea. They walk through on dry land, get to the other side, and the other side is the promised land. The first place they have to go, and this is one of my favorite parts. The, the water part is pretty, 